Welcome to Vet Talk, the veterinary podcast. Thanks for joining us. Check out LickingValleyVet.com under the education section to find a complete list of the podcast episodes. And while you're at the website, visit our blog section. If you have questions or comments, please email us at theveterinarypodcast at gmail.com. And you can like the Licking Valley Veterinary Hospital's Facebook page if you want a more regular feed of when episodes and blogs are released. So today I thought we'd mix things up a bit and just run through a case. We keep talking about these broad subjects in veterinary medicine, but let's apply this knowledge that we are learning and see how we use it in a case. So let's get right to it. A horse and a foal come in. The owner is concerned because the foal is limping on its right rear leg. Trying to evaluate the foal becomes problematic because the mare is rather upset and won't stand still or allow us to evaluate her baby. We give the mare a mild sedative, some detomidine, and she calms down. Well, except for when she saw a llama. She doesn't like llamas, but other than llamas, she's a happy mother when she's on her drugs. We do a quick exam on the mare and she is fine, and the owner reports she is up to date on all her vaccinations. So now we focus on the foal. So the baby is obviously limping on the right leg. The foal is named Penny, seems a little shaky and a little weak. So we start asking a few questions. How old is Penny? Seven days. Okay. Any complications with the foaling? Okay, no. How long did it take for Penny to stand up? Okay, okay, about four hours. Anything else? Have you treated the foal with any drugs? Okay, so Penny was lethargic for the first three to four days of her life and didn't move around too much. She got a dose of tetanus antitoxin and because she was lethargic, um, you all gave a dose of some Naxel uh, you had on hand for something else. For those of you that don't know, Naxel is a third generation cephalosporin. It kills bacteria by inhibiting cell wall synthesis. So with this history, even without touching Penny, I have a few questions I need answered. Was this foaling really normal? Was there adequate passive transfer? And was there trauma at foaling? Before we can determine if the birth or foaling was really normal, What is a normal birthing process for a horse? For the mother, the normal birth process is broken into three stages. Stage one can last anywhere from 30 minutes to four hours. This is where you see a restless mare. They may show signs of colic or may lie down and get up repeatedly. What's happening physiologically is the uterus is starting to contract and the contractions are becoming more intense. Also, the cervix is starting to dilate or open, and the chorioallantoic membrane is starting to poke through the opening in the cervix. All those things are why the mare acts uncomfortable. Because, well, I'm not a girl, but I feel like if someone's uterus is contracting, it's an uncomfortable feeling. So that's stage one. And the mare has this interesting ability where she can prolong stage one. If she thinks a predator is around, she can extend stage one for hours until she thinks that predator has moved away. Because she can't protect her baby when she's giving birth. Growing up, my family had a lot of babies on our farm. Being a young kid, this was always interesting to me. So I'd go out every day I was off school and every half hour or hour to check to see if our pregnant mares had their baby. We knew they were close. They were showing all the discomfort signs that go along with birthing. But guess what? This little predator named Little Dr. Nathan kept poking his head into the stall. So the mare said, I'm going to wait. Eventually the horse realized I wasn't a threat and had the baby. But the mare was able to hold off having that baby until she felt safe. So stage one can go for a much longer time than you think. When you call your vet upset about a baby not coming, we as vets may not be as nervous as you because often we know you are standing right over the mare and can actually hear the mare on the phone saying, I'll wait until you leave. And I've told clients time and time again, leave the horse alone. Let it do its thing. And clients can't. They want to be there for the miracle of life and birth. 
which is fine, but what I would recommend is security cameras. Set them up so you can watch from a distance so you don't disturb the mare. When you see she's actually having the baby, then you can come out and witness the miracle of life. On to stage two. This is the exciting part. Typically when stage two starts, it's over and done with in 30 minutes. This is the expulsion of the fetus. She's having a baby! If the baby isn't out in 45 minutes, call the vet. It's an emergency. There are very few true veterinary emergencies. A foal that isn't out of its mother in 45 minutes, that's an emergency. Hopefully stage two is over quick and easy. Then on to stage three. This can take about three hours to occur. This is where the fetal membranes are expelled. In layman's terms, this is where the mare pushes the placenta out of herself. Okay, well, simple enough. We have a baby now. Well, we're not done. A normal foaling has to deal with the baby as well. We need a few things to happen with a very specific timeline. First, in one hour we need the foal standing. In two hours the foal should have nursed. In three hours the foal should have passed its first poop, or meconium, taken a little run around the stall, and maybe be napping now. From our history with Penny, I know she is doing okay on passing the meconium, because if she hadn't, she would be acting sick and colicky now. We understand that standing is important, because if a horse can't stand in the wild, it can't run from a predator. But why is nursing so important? Well, here's the scientific answer. Mares have a diffuse microcotyledonary epithelial corial placentation. Whew. This is a fancy way of saying the mother doesn't transfer her immunity to the baby in the womb. So how does the mother get immune protection to the baby? You guessed it, by nursing. The mother makes colostrum, her first milk, for a short amount of time, and this colostrum is packed full of amino protection. These are really large proteins that get into the foal and protect from everything that the mother herself is protected from. Ah, but one more problem. Foals can only absorb colostrum for the first 12 to 18 hours of their life. The proteins in colostrum are so big that a normal digestive tract of a horse can't absorb these molecules. So for about 18 hours, a foal's digestive tract hasn't completely closed down. It stays open for 18 hours and allows those proteins to transfer into the body. After 18 hours, the intestine becomes impermeable to these large proteins and digestive enzymes will start flowing, which degrade the protective proteins. Colostrum is worthless given orally 18 hours after birth. Generally, what I do if we are concerned about the baby not receiving its protective immunity from its mother through passive transfer, which is the process I just described, is I draw some blood and check its IgG, or immunoglobulin, levels. I do this about 12 to 16 hours after birth. 12 being more preferable. If you don't have high levels of immune protection, that gives you roughly, if you don't have high enough levels of immune protection, that gives you roughly four to six hours to get colostrum in the baby. If you don't get that colostrum in the baby, you have to give immune plasma directly into the blood. Anyway, hopefully the baby is nursing within two hours and all this isn't a problem. Other common things you can do to protect a baby from its newfound dirty home is dip its umbilicus in some betadine. Because the umbilicus is a hot spot for bacteria and is a direct link inside the body past most of the foal's normal protective mechanisms. So back to Penny. 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 I do my physical exam. The temperature is 101.3, which is fine. Normal is 99 to 102. The heart rate is 120, just a little high, but Penny just got off a trailer and is a little excited. Same with respirations, 66 breaths per minute, just a little high, 40 is the high end of normal. The mucous membranes were pink and the capillary refill time less than two, showing me the heart was working fine. No dehydration was noted and the intestines sounded normal but the lung sounds were a little increased or a little louder than normal. 
Also, I noted that Penny did not look like a premature baby, as she didn't have a domed forehead, no floppy ears, and no tendon laxity, and did not have silky hair. Also, the owners were aware of the breeding time and the gestation length was as planned. I then went to investigate why the lungs sounded rough. I brought out some alcohol, doused some of the hair with alcohol, and looked at the abdomen and umbilicus, which both looked fine. And then I looked at the lungs. The lungs had some consolidation in them. Consolidation is a fancy term for junk in the lungs. So that explained the increased respiratory rate. It wasn't just a trailer ride. Moving on, I found that the right rear limb, which was lame, also had a big swelling in the stifle region. So we took some radiographs or x-rays of the stifle. The owner saw the x-ray and was distraught. Oh my gosh, it's fractured. Actually, no, it wasn't fractured. There was swelling in the x-rays, in the soft tissues, but the bones looked fine. There were a lot of holes in the bones, but they were normal. This is a young baby. The growth plates hadn't stopped growing, so there were gaps between the bones. This was normal. But this did point us to the fact that there was very likely an infection in the stifle joint causing the lameness. So we scrubbed the foal, stuck a needle in the joint, and drained some fluid, and then drew blood from the foal and sent all of that to the lab for a barrage of tests. Here's one for the vet students. Decode this. The CBC came back with a leukocytosis characterized by lymphopenia and neutrophilia. IgG levels were acceptable at 800 milligrams per deciliter. The synovial fluid, or joint fluid, was yellow, hazy, had 13,000 white blood cells in it, and 3.5 grams per deciliter of protein. No infectious agents were noted, however. But the lab was nice enough to put some other information in. Because purulent inflammation with some evidence of chronicity was noted due to macrophages and cytophagia, it is assumed that sepsis is occurring. So we have an infection, an infection in two areas of the body, lungs and joints. So now what? What's going on? So I make a differential list in my head, two big problems and what could cause them. One, septic arthritis, and two, pneumonia. So what can cause septic arthritis? I start ticking things off in front of the owner. Trauma, like a penetrating wound, failure of passive transfer, which causes no immune defenses in the body, and those bacteria that are in the environment, such as Salmonella, Actinobacillus, E. coli, or Klebsiella, then can easily get in the body, and there's nothing to defend against them without that passive transfer of immunity protection. Maybe they get in through an open umbilicus, and then into the bloodstream. Then the bacteria can go anywhere in the body by traveling through that circulatory system. And often, once in the blood, bacteria stop at joints because blood flow is slower in joints, so the bacteria just settle down and then set up shop. And maybe a stifle joint? Or since all blood flows from the heart to the lungs, and to the rest of the body, maybe the bacteria got stuck in the lungs and then set up shop causing junk in the lungs. Or maybe it wasn't from the umbilicus. Maybe the foal aspirated some milk directly after birth. Or maybe during birth aspirated some meconium, that poop, directly into the lungs. Bacteria then set up shop in the lungs and then started spreading from the lungs through the blood to a joint. If you remember, this foal took four hours to get up. It was lethargic for the first few days. It sounds like something went wrong with the birthing process. It nursed, but maybe not before some bacteria got into some places they shouldn't be. Maybe that's why we aren't running a fever. The foal got enough colostrum to slow the bacteria, but not beat them. The foal's body is just holding everything at bay and slowly losing. Or maybe it was the antibiotics the owners were giving that is holding the infection at bay. And I don't really care which way it happened. I just need to fix it now and make sure we have a live animal. And make sure the owners know the possibilities of what happened so they can prevent it from happening again in the future, if it's even possible. So what is our treatment? I go ahead and give potassium penicillin IV for every six hours. That kills gram-positive organisms. 
Then I give amicacin IV every 24 hours that kills gram-negative bacterial organisms. Why so much? Well, the lab suspects a bacterial agent, but we don't know which bacteria. So we have to treat to kill everything. Then we give some ketoprofen IV twice a day to control pain and limit inflammation. We keep the foal and mother and monitor it. On day two, we notice coughing and re-ultrasound. There's more junk in the lungs. Not good. We go ahead and add metronidazole every eight hours to limit anaerobic infection and are happy to notice that Penny is still in bright spirits as long as Penny can chew on my pants leg. If Penny is not chewing on my pants leg, she gets rather depressed. Day 3. The cough starts decreasing and lameness starts getting better. Day 4. Coughing is decreased even more and the white blood cell counts are decreasing, i.e. repeat blood work is getting better. Day 5. Penny is able to walk with very little lameness. Things are looking better. The lungs are sounding better, but not completely improved, and the ultrasound shows that most of the junk is starting to disappear and dissipate. Our blood culture we sent off gets back from the lab, and no bacteria are found in the blood. So that means we found no bacteria in the joint, and none in the blood. So did we have an infection? Did we have an infection, and it was cleared before we got to it? Well, 50% of joint taps and folds can be negative, and there is still a bacterial infection. Lab work isn't always perfect. So I'm pretty sure this foal got infected from something that went wrong in the first few hours of its life, and we were seeing the consequences, a lung and joint infection. Did he aspirate something into his lungs? Did it come through the umbilicus? Would it have helped if Penny nursed just a few hours earlier? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? We don't know. We won't know. But by day nine, Penny was playing and galloping around. We know what could have went wrong, and we know what to watch for in the future and try to prevent. And we know that Penny could go home. So Penny got some oral medications and was sent home for the rest of her treatments. At home, she was given some cefepidoxime twice a day and metronidazole three times a day for two weeks. These were all orally given so the owners could give them at home. Owners were told to watch for the return of lameness, fever, depression, or difficulty breathing, and diarrhea. <sighs> so we're done, and Penny is saved! Uh-oh. Well, not quite. We reevaluated Penny a week later for coughing and grass coming out of Penny's nose. Turned out, Penny had some hog-like behavior, and once Penny was feeling better, tried to eat everything in sight. And then she choked on it because she was eating too fast. Nothing a muzzle didn't prevent future problems with. Penny went home again and this time had no other problems. So this case shows us a few things. First, one problem can cause multiple problems. And sometimes we don't know what actually the first problem is. But as long as we can treat and see an animal get better, it doesn't always matter as long as we can try to prevent such things from happening again. I hope you enjoyed working through a case. Obviously, there are some differences. I streamlined it because our lab tests don't come so quickly in real life. But let me know if you like hearing about individual animals, and we will do a few more cases in the future. Check out the website, LickingValleyVet.com, to find more information about blogs and a link to our podcast episodes. If you have questions or comments, email us at theveterinarypodcast at gmail.com.